Part One of Prometheus Bound by Aeschylus, translated by Theodore Alois Buckley. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dramatis Personae, narrated by Charlotte Duckett. Prometheus, read by Jason Mills. Chorus of Nymphs, Daughters of Ocean, read by Elizabeth Clett. Strength. Read by Bob Newfeld. Force. Mute part. Vulcan. Read by Alan Mapstone. Ocean. Read by Amanda Friday. Io. Read by Avai. Mercury. Read by Lambda. Enter Strength, Force, Vulcan, Prometheus. We are come to a plain, the distant boundary of the earth, to the Scythian track to an untrodden desert. Balkan, it behooves thee that the mandate which thy sire imposed be thy concern, to bind this daring wretch to the lofty cragged rocks in fetters of adamantine chains that cannot be broken. For he stole and gave to mortals thy honour, the brilliancy of fire that aids all arts. Hence, for such a trespass, he must needs give retribution to the gods, that he may be taught to submit to the sovereignty of Jupiter, and to cease from his philanthropic disposition. Strength and force. As far as you are concerned, the mandate of Jupiter has now its consummation, and there is no farther obstacle. But I have not the courage to bind perforce a kindred god to this weather-beaten ravine. Yet in every way it is necessary for me to take courage for this task, for a dreadful thing it is to disregard the directions of the sire. Lofty scheming son of right counselling Thamus, unwilling shall I rivet thee unwilling in indissoluble shackles to this solitary rock where nor voice nor form of any one of mortals shall thou see, but slowly scorched by the bright blaze of the sun, thou shalt lose the bloom of thy complexion, and to thee joyless shall night in spangled robe veil the light, and the sun again disperse the hoar-frost of the morn, and evermore shall the pain of the present evil waste thee, for no one yet born shall release thee such fruits hast thou reaped for thy friendly disposition to mankind for thou a god not crouching beneath the wrath of the gods hast imparted to mortals honours beyond what was right in requital whereof thou shalt keep sentinel on this cheerless rock standing erect sleepless not bending a knee and many laments and unavailing groans shalt thou utter for well, the heart of Jupiter is hard to be entreated, and every one that has newly acquired power is stern. Well, well, why art thou delaying and vainly commiserating? Why loathest thou not the god that is most hateful to the gods, who has betrayed thy prerogative to mortals? Relationship and intimacy are of great power. I grant it. But how is it possible to disobey the sire's word? Dreadest thou not this the rather? I truly, thou art ever pitiless and full of boldness. For to deplore this wretch is no cure for him. But concern not thou thyself vainly with matters that are of no advantage. O oh, much detested handicraft! Wherefore loathest thou it? For with the ills now present, thy craft in good truth is not at all chargeable. For all that, I would that some other had obtained this. Everything has been achieved except for the gods to rule, for no one is free save Jupiter. I know it, and I have nothing to say against it. Wilt thou not then bestir thyself to cast fetters about this wretch, that the sire may not espy thee loitering. Ay, and in truth you may see the manacles ready. Take them, and with mighty force clench them with the mallet about his hands, rivet him close to the crags. 
this work of ours is speeding to its consummation and loiters not smite harder tighten slacken at no point for he hath cunning to find outlets even from impracticable difficulties this arm at all events is fastened inextricably and now clasp this securely that he may perceive himself to be a duller contriver than jupiter save this sufferer no one could with reason find fault with me now by main force rivet the ruthless fang of an adamantine wedge right through his breast alas alas prometheus i sigh over thy sufferings again thou art hanging back and sighest thou over the enemies of jupiter look to it that thou hast not at some time to mourn for thyself thou beholdest a spectacle ill-sighted to the eye i behold this wretch receiving his deserts i must needs do this urge me not very much ay but i will urge thee and set thee on to move downward and strongly link his legs and in truth the task is done with no long toil with main force now smite the galling fetters since stern indeed is the inspector of this work thy tongue sounds in accordance with thy form yield thou to softness but taunt not me with ruthlessness and harshness of temper let us go since he hath the shackles about his limbs there now be insolent and after pillaging the prerogatives of the gods confer them on creatures of a day in what will mortals be able to alleviate these agonies of thine by no true title to the divinities call thee prometheus for thou thyself hast need of a prometheus by means of which you will slip out of this fate exeunt strength and force o divine ether and ye swift-winged breezes and ye fountains of rivers and countless dimpling of the waves of the deep and thou earth mother of all and to the all-seeing orb of the sun i appeal look upon me what treatment i a god am enduring at the hand of the gods behold with what indignities mangled i shall have to wrestle through time of years innumerable such an ignominious bondage hath the new ruler of the immortals devised against me alas alas i sigh over the present suffering and that which is coming on how where must a termination of these toils arise and yet what is it i am saying i know beforehand all futurity exactly and no suffering will come upon me unlooked for but i needs must bear my doom as easily as may be knowing as i do that the might of necessity cannot be resisted but yet it is not possible for me either to hold my peace or not to hold my peace touching these my fortunes for having bestowed boons upon mortals i am enthralled unhappy in these hardships and i am he that searched out the source of fire by stealth borne off enclosed in a fennel rod which has shown itself a teacher of every art to mortals and a great resource such then as this is the vengeance that i must endure for my trespasses being riveted in fetters beneath the naked sky ha ah, what sound what ineffable order hath been wafted to me emanating from a god or from mortal or of some intermediate nature has there come any one to the rock as a spectator of my sufferings or with what intent behold me an ill-fated god endurance the foe of jupiter him that hath incurred the detestation of all the gods who frequent the court of jupiter by reason of my excessive friendliness to mortals alas alas what can this hasty motion of birds be which i again hear hard by me the air too is whistling faintly with the whirrings of pinions everything that approaches is to me an object of dread dread thou nothing for this is a friendly band that has come with the fleet rivalry of their pinions to this rock after prevailing with difficulty on the mind of our father and the swiftly wafting breezes escorted me for the echo of the clang of steel pierced to the recess of our grots and banished my demure-looking reserve and i sped without my sandals and my winged chariot alas alas ye offspring of prolific thetis and daughters of ocean your sire 
who rolls around the whole earth in his unslumbering stream, look upon me, see clasped in what bonds I shall keep an unenviable watch on the topmost crags of this ravine. I see, Prometheus, and a fearful mist full of tears darts over mine eyes as I looked on thy frame withering on the rocks in these galling adamantine fetters. For new pilots are the masters of Olympus, and Jove, contrary to right, lords it with new laws, and things aforetime had in reverence he is obliterating. Oh, would that he had sent me beneath the earth, and below into the boundless Tartarus of Hades that receives the dead, after savagely securing me in indissoluble bonds, so that no god at any time, nor any other being, had exulted in this my doom. Whereas now, hapless one, I, the sport of the winds, suffer pangs that gladden my foes. Who of the gods is so hard-hearted as that these things should be grateful to him? Who is there that sympathizes not with thy sufferings? Jove accepted. He, indeed, in his wrath, assuming an inflexible temper, is evermore oppressing the celestial race. Nor will he cease before that either he shall have sated his heart, or some one by some stratagem shall have seized upon his sovereignty that will be no easy prize. In truth hereafter the President of the Immortals shall have need of me, albeit that I am ignominiously suffering in stubborn shackles, to discover to him the new plot by which he is to be despoiled of his sceptre and his honours. But neither shall he win me by the honey-tongued charms of persuasion, nor will I, at any time, crouching beneath his stern threats, divulge this matter, before he shall have released me from my cruel bonds, and shall be willing to yield me retribution for this outrage. Thou indeed both art bold, and yieldest not to thy bitter calamities, but art over free in thy language. But piercing terror is worrying my soul, for I fear for thy fortunes. How, when will it be thy destiny to make the haven and see the end of these thy sufferings? For the son of Saturn has manners that supplication cannot reach, and an inexorable heart. I know that Jupiter is harsh, and keeps justice to himself, but for all that he shall hereafter be softened in purpose, when he shall be crushed in this way, and after calming his unyielding temper with eagerness will he hereafter come into league and friendship with me, that will eagerly welcome him. Unfold, and speak out to us the whole story, from what accusation has Jupiter seized thee, and is thus disgracefully and bitterly tormenting thee. Inform us, if thou be in no respect hurt by the recital. Painful indeed are these things for me to tell, and painful too for me to hold my peace, and in every way grievous. As soon as the divinities began discord, and a feud was stirred up among them with one another, one party wishing to eject Saturn from his throne, in order forsooth that Jupiter might be king, and others expediting the reverse, that Jupiter might at no time rule over the gods. Then I, when I gave the best advice, was not able to prevail upon the Titans, children of Uranus and Terra, but they, contemning in their stout spirits wily schemes, fancied that without any trouble, and by dint of main force, they were to win the sovereignty. But it was not once only that my mother Themis, and Terra, a single person with many titles, had forewarned me of the way in which the future would be accomplished. How it was destined that, not by main force, nor by the strong hand, but by craft the victors should prevail. When, however, I explained such points in discourse, they deigned not to pay me any regard at all. Of the plans which then presented themselves to me, the best appeared that I should take my mother and promptly side with Jupiter, who was right willing to receive us. And tis by means of my counsels that the murky abyss of Tartarus overwhelms the antique Saturn, allies and all. After thus being assisted by me, the tyrant of the gods hath recompensed me with this foul recompense. For somehow this malady attaches to tyranny, not to put confidence in its friends. But for your inquiries upon what charge it is that he outrages me, this I will make clear. As soon as he has established himself on his father's throne, he assigns forthwith to the different divinities each his honours, and he was marshalling in order his empire. But of woe-begone mortals he made no account, but wished, after having annihilated the entire race, to plant another new one. And these schemes no one opposed except myself. But I dared. I ransomed mortals from being utterly destroyed, and going down to Hades. Tis for this, in truth, that I am bent by suffering such as these, agonising to endure, and piteous to look upon. I that had compassion for mortals, 
have myself been deemed unworthy to obtain this, but mercilessly am thus coerced to order, a spectacle inglorious to Jupiter. Iron-hearted and formed of rock, too, Prometheus, is he who condoles not with thy toils. For I could have wished never to have beheld them, and now when I behold them I am pained in my heart. I, in very deed, I am a piteous object for friends to behold. And didst thou chance to advance even beyond this? Yes. I prevented mortals from foreseeing their doom. By finding what remedy for this malady? I caused blind hopes to dwell within them. In this thou gavest a mighty benefit to mortals. Over and above these boons, however, I imparted fire to them. And do the creatures of a day now possess bright fire? Yes, from which they will moreover learn thoroughly many arts. Is it indeed on charges such as these that Jupiter is both visiting thee with indignities, and in no wise grants thee a respite from thy pains? And is no period to thy toils set before thee? None other assuredly, but when it may please him. And how shall it be his good pleasure? What hope is there? Seest thou not that thou didst err? But how thou didst err I cannot relate with pleasure, and it would be a pain to you. But let us leave these points, and search thou for some escape from thine agony. Tis easy, for any one that hath his foot unentangled by sufferings, both to exhort and to admonish him that is in evil plight. But I knew all these things willingly. Willingly I erred, and I will not gainsay it, and in doing service to mortals I brought upon myself sufferings. Yet not at all did I imagine that in such a punishment as this I was to wither away upon lofty rocks, meeting with this desolate, solitary crag. And yet wail ye not over my present sorrows, but after alighting on the ground, list ye to the fortune that is coming on, that ye may learn the whole throughout. Yield to me, yield ye, take ye a share in the wars of him that is now suffering. Hence in the same way doth calamity, roaming to and fro, settle down on different individuals. Upon those who are nothing loath hast thou urged this, Prometheus, and now, having with light step quitted my rapidly wafting chariot seat, and the pure ether, highway of the feathered race, I will draw near to this rugged ground, and I long to hear the whole tale of thy sufferings. Enter Ocean I am arrived at the end of a long journey, having passed over it to thee, Prometheus, guiding this winged steed of mine, swift of pinion, by my will, without a bit, and rest assured I sorrow with thy misfortunes, for both the tie of kindred thus constrains me, and relationship apart, there is no one on whom I would bestow a larger share of my regard than to thyself. And thou shalt know that these words are sincere, and that it is not in me vainly to do lip service. For come, signify to me in what it is necessary for me to assist thee, for at no time shalt thou say that thou hast a stauncher friend than Oceanus. Ha! What means this? And hast thou too come to be a witness of my pangs? How hast thou ventured, after quitting both the stream that bears thy name, and the rock-roofed self-wrought grots, to come into the iron-teeming land? Is it that you may contemplate my misfortunes, and as sympathising with my woes that thou hast come? Behold a spectacle, me here the friend of Jupiter, that helped to establish his sovereignty, with what pains I am bent by him. I see, Prometheus, and to thee, subtle as thou art, I wish to give the best counsel. Know thyself, and assume to thyself new manners, for among the gods, too, there is a new monarch. But if thou wilt utter words thus harsh and wedded, Jupiter may hap, though seated far aloft, will hear thee, so that the present bitterness of sufferings will seem to thee to be child's play. But, O oh, hapless one, dismiss the passion which thou feelest, and search for a deliverance from these sufferings of thine. Old-fashioned maxims these, it may be, I appear to thee to utter. Yet such becomes the wages of the tongue that talks too proudly. But not even yet art thou humble, nor submittest to ills. And in addition to those that already beset thee, thou art willing to bring others upon thee. Yet not, if at least thou takest me for thy instructor, wilt thou stretch out thy leg against the pricks, as thou seest that a harsh monarch, and one that is not subject to control, is lording it. And now I, for my part, will go, and will essay, if I be able, 
to disenthrall thee from these thy pangs but be thou still nor be over impetuous in thy language what knowest thou not exactly extremely intelligent as thou art that punishment is inflicted on a forward tongue i give thee joy because that thou hast escaped censure after taking part in and venturing along with me in all things and now leave him alone and let it not concern thee for in no wise wilt thou persuade him for he is not open to persuasion and look thou well to it that thou take not harm thyself by the journey thou art far better calculated by nature to instruct thy neighbours than thyself i draw my conclusion from fact and not from word but think not for a moment to divert me from the attempt for i am confident yea i am confident that jupiter will grant me this boon so as to release thee from these pangs of thine in part i commend thee and will by no means at any time cease to do so for in zeal to serve me thou lackest nothing but trouble thyself not for in vain without being of any service to me wilt thou labour if in any respect thou art willing to labour but hold thou thy peace and keep thyself out of harm's way for i though i be in misfortune would not on this account be willing that sufferings should befall as many as possible no indeed since also the disasters of my brother atlas gall my heart who is stationed in the western regions sustaining on his shoulders the pillar of heaven and of earth a burden not of easy grasp i commiserated too when i beheld the earth-born inmate of the cilician caverns a tremendous prodigy the hundred-headed impetuous typhon overpowered by force who withstood all the gods hissing slaughter from his hungry jaws and from his eyes there flashed a hideous glare as though he would perforce overthrow the sovereignty of jove but the sleepless shaft of jupiter came upon him the descending thunderbolt breathing forth flame which scared him out of his presumptuous bravados for having been smitten to his very soul he was crumbled to a cinder and thunder blasted in his prowess and now a helpless and paralysed form is he lying hard by a narrow frith pressed down beneath the roots of etna and seated on the topmost peaks vulcan forges the molten masses whence there shall one day burst forth floods devouring with fell jaws the level fields of fruitful sicily with rage such as this shall typhon boil over in hot artillery of a never glutted fire-breathing storm albeit he hath been reduced to ashes by the thunderbolt of jupiter but thou art no novice nor needest thou me for thine instructor save thyself as best thou knowest how but i will exhaust my present fate until such time as the spirit of jupiter shall abate its wrath knowest thou not this then prometheus that words are the physicians of a distempered feeling true if one seasonably soften down the heart and do not with rude violence reduce a swelling spirit ay but in foresight along with boldness what mischief is there that thou cease to be inherent inform me superfluous trouble and trifling folly suffer me to sicken in this said sickness since tis of the highest advantage for one that is wise not to seem to be wise not so for this trespass will seem to be mine thy language is plainly sending me back to my home lest thy lamentation over me bring thee into ill will what with him who hath lately seated himself on the throne that ruleth over all beware of him lest at any time his heart be moved to wrath thy disaster prometheus is my monitor away withdraw thee keep thy present determination on me hastening to start hast thou urged this injunction for my winged quadruped flaps with his pinions the smooth track of ether and blithely would he recline his limbs in his stalls at home Exit ocean i bewail thee for thy lost fate prometheus a flood of trickling tears from my yielding eyes has bedewed my cheek with its humid gushings for jupiter commanding this thine unenviable doom by laws of his own displays his spear appearing superior o'er the gods of old and now the whole land echoes with wailing they wail thy stately and time-graced honours and those of thy brethren and all they of mortal race that occupy a dwelling neighbouring on hallowed asia mourn with thy deeply deplorable sufferings the virgins that dwell in the land of colchis too fearless of the fight and the scythian horde who possess the most remote regions of earth around lake maotis and the warlike flower of arabia who occupy a fortress on the craggy heights in the neighbourhood of caucasus a warrior host clamouring amid sharply barbed spears 
One other god only, indeed, have I heretofore beheld in miseries. The titan Atlas, subdued by the galling of adamantine bonds, who evermore in his back is groaning beneath the excessive mighty mass of the pole of heaven. And the billow of the deep roars as it falls in cadence, the depth moans, and the murky vault of Hades rumbles beneath the earth, and the fountains of the pure streaming rivers wail for his piteous pains. Do not, I pray you, suppose that I am holding my peace from pride or self-will, but by reflection am I gnawed to the heart, seeing myself thus ignominiously entreated, and yet who but myself defined completely the prerogative for these same new gods? But on these matters I say nothing, for I should speak to you already acquainted with these things. But for the misfortunes that existed among mortals, hear how I made them, that aforetime lived as infants, rational, and possessed of intellect. And I will tell you, having no complaint against mankind, as detailing the kindness of the boons which I bestowed upon them, they who at first seeing saw in vain, hearing they heard not, but, like to the forms of dreams, for a long time they used to huddle together all things at random, and naught knew they about brick-built and sunward houses, nor carpentry, but they dwelt in the excavated earth like tiny emmets in the sunless depths of caverns, and they had no sure sign either of winter, or of flowery spring, or of fruitful summer, but they used to do everything without judgment, until indeed I showed to them the risings of the stars and their settings, hard to be discerned, and verily I discover for them numbers, the surpassing all inventions, the combinations too of letters, and memory, effective mother-nurse of all arts, I also first bound with yokes beasts submissive to the collars, and in order that with their bodies they might become to mortals substitutes for their severest toils, I brought steeds under cars obedient to the rein, a glory to pompous luxury. And none other than I invented the canvas-winged chariots of mariners that roam over the ocean. After discovering for mortals such inventions, wretch that I am, I myself have no device whereby I may escape from my present misery. Thou hast suffered unseemly ills. Balked in thy discretion thou art erring, and like a bad physician, having fallen into a distemper, thou art faint-hearted, and in reference to thyself thou canst not discover by what manner of medicines thou mayst be cured. When thou hearest the rest of my tale, thou wilt wonder still more what arts and resources I contrived. For the greatest, if that any one fell into a distemper, there was no remedy neither in the way of diet, nor of liniment, nor of portion, but for lack of medicines they used to pine away to skeletons, before that I pointed out to them the composition of mild remedies, wherewith they ward off all their maladies. Many modes too of the divining art did I classify, and was the first that discriminated among dreams those which are destined to be a true vision. Obscure vocal omens too I made known to them, tokens also incidental on the road, and the flight of birds of crooked talons I clearly defined both those that are in their nature auspicious and the ill-omened, and what are the kind of life that each leads, and what are their feuds and endearments, and intercourse one with another, the smoothness too of the entrails, and what hue they must have to be acceptable to the gods, the various happy formations of the gall and liver, and the limbs enveloped in fat, and having roasted the long chine, I pointed out to mortals the way into an abstruse art, and I brought to light the fiery symbols that were aforetime wrapped in darkness, such indeed were these boons, and the gains to mankind that were hidden underground, brass, iron, silver, and gold, who could assert that he had discovered before me? No one, I well know, who does not mean to idly babble, and in one brief sentence learn the whole at once, all arts among the human race are from Prometheus. Do not now serve the human race beyond what is profitable, nor disregard thyself in thy distress, since I have good hopes that thou shalt yet be liberated from these shackles, and be not one whit less powerful than Jove. Not at all in this way is fate, that brings events to their consummation, ordained to accomplish these things. But after having been bent by countless sufferings and calamities, thus am I to escape from my shackles, and art is far less powerful than necessity. Who then is the pilot of necessity? The triform fates, and the remembering furies. Is Jupiter, then, less powerful than these? Most certainly he cannot at any rate escape his doom. Why, what is doomed for Jupiter but to reign for evermore? This thou mayest not yet learn, and do not press it. Tis surely some solemn mystery that thou veilest. Make mention of some other matter. It is by no means seasonable to proclaim this. 
but it must be shrouded in deepest concealment, for it is by keeping this secret that I am to escape from my ignominious shackles and miseries. Never may Jupiter, who directs all things, set his might in opposition to my purpose. Nor may I be backward in attending upon the gods at their hallowed banquets, at which oxen are sacrificed, beside the restless stream of my sire Ocean. And may I not trespass in my words, but may this feeling abide by me and never melt away. Sweet it is to pass through a long life in confident hopes, making the spirit swell with bright merriment. But I shudder as I behold thee harrowed by agonies incalculable. For not standing in awe of Jupiter, thou, Prometheus, in thy self-will, honourest mortals to excess. Come, my friend, own how boonless was the boon. Say, where is any aid? What relief can come from the creatures of a day? Sawest thou not the powerless weakness, not better than a dream, in which the blind race of men is entangled? Never shall at any time the schemes of mortals evade the harmonious system of Jupiter. This I learned by witnessing thy destructive fate, Prometheus. And far different is this strain that now flits toward me from the hymeneal chant which I raised around the baths and thy couch with the consent of nuptials, when, after having won Hesione with thy love tokens, thou didst conduct her, our sister, to be thy bride, the sharer of thy bed. End of part one. Part two of Prometheus Bound by Aeschylus, translated by Theodore Alois Buckley. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Enter Io. What land is this? What race? Whom shall I say I here behold storm tossed in rocky fetters? Of what trespass is the retribution destroying thee? Declare to me into what part of earth I forlorn have roamed. Ah, me, alas, alas, again the hornet stings me miserable. O oh, earth, avert the goblin of earth-born Argus. I am terrified at the sight of the neither of thousand eyes, for he is journeying on, keeping a cunning glance, whom not even after death does earth conceal. But issuing forth from among the departed, he chases me miserable, and he makes me to wander famished along the shingled strand, while the sounding wax-compacted pipe drones on a sleepy strain. Oh, oh, ye powers! Oh, powers! Whither do my far-roaming wanderings convey me? In what, in what, O son of Saturn, hast thou, having found me transgressing, shackled me in these pangs? Ah, ah, and art thus wearing out a timorous wretch frenzied with sting-driven fear? Burn me with fire, or bury me in earth, or give me for food to the monsters of the deep, and grudge me not these prayers, O king." Amply have my much-traversed wanderings harassed me, nor can I discover how I may avoid pain. Hearest thou the address of the ox-horned maiden? How can I fail to hear the damsel that is frenzied driven by the hornet, the daughter of Inachus, who warms the heart of Jupiter with love, and now, aboard of Juno, is driven perforce courses of exceeding length? From whence utterest thou the name of my father? Tell me, the woe begone, who thou art, who, I say, O hapless one, that hast thus correctly accosted me miserable, and hast named the heaven-inflicted disorder which wastes me, fretting with its maddening stings? Ah, ah, violently driven by the famishing tortures of my boundings, have I come a victim to the wrathful counsels of Juno. And of the ill-fated who are there, ah, me, that endure woes such as mine? But do thou clearly define to me what remains for me to suffer, what self, what remedy there is for my malady, 
discover to me if at all thou knowest speak tell it to the wretched roaming damsel i will tell thee clearly everything which thou desirest to learn not interweaving riddles but in plain language as it is right to open the mouth to friends thou seest him that bestowed fire on mortals prometheus o oh, thou that didst dawn a common benefit upon mortals wretched prometheus as penance for what offence art thou thus suffering i have just ceased lamenting my own pangs wilt thou not then accord to me this boon say what it is that thou art asking for thou mightest learn everything from me say who it was that bound thee fast in this cleft the decree of jupiter but the hand of vulcan and for what offences art thou paying the penalty thus much alone is all that i can clearly explain to thee at least in addition to this discover what time shall be to me woe-worn the limit of my wanderings not to learn this is better for thee than to learn it yet conceal not from me what i am to endure nay i grudge thee not this gift why then delayest thou to utter the whole tis not reluctance but i am loath to shock thy feelings do not be more anxious on my account than is agreeable to me since thou art eager i must needs tell thee attend thou not yet however but grant me also a share of the pleasure let us first learn the malady of this maiden from her own tale of her destructive fortunes but for the sequel of her afflictions let her be informed by thee it is thy part i owe to minister to the gratification of these now before thee both for all other reasons and that they are the sisters of thy father since to weep and lament over misfortunes when one is sure to win a tear from the listeners is well worth the while i know not how i should disobey you and in a plain tale ye shall learn everything that ye desire and yet i am pained even to speak of the tempest that hath been sent upon me from heaven and the utter marring of my person whence it suddenly came upon me a wretched creature for nightly visions thronging to my maiden chamber would entice me with smooth words o oh, damsel greatly fortunate why dost thou live long time in maidenhood when it is in thy power to achieve a match the very noblest for jupiter is fired by thy charms with the shaft of passion and longs with thee to share in love but do not my child spurn away from thee the couch of jupiter but go forth to learn us fertile mead to the folds and ox stalls of thy father that the eye of jove may have respite from its longing by dreams such as these was i unhappy beset every night until at length i made bold to tell my sire of the dreams that haunted me by night and he dispatched both to pytho and dodona many a messenger to consult the oracles that he might learn what it behooved him to do or say so as to perform what was well pleasing to the divinities and they came bringing a report back of oracles ambiguously worded indistinct and obscurely delivered but at last a clear response came to inachus plainly charging and directing him to thrust me forth both from my home and my country to stay an outcast to earth's remotest limits and that if he would not a fiery visaged thunderbolt would come from jupiter and utterly blot out his whole race overcome by oracles of loxias such as these unwilling did me expel and exclude me unwilling from his dwelling but the bit of jupiter perforce constrained him to do this and straightway my person and my mind were distorted and horned as ye see stung by the keenly biting fly i rushed with maniac boundings to the sweet stream of kirchneia and the fountain of lerna and the earth-born nethered argus of untempered fierceness kept dogging me peering after my footsteps with thick-set eyes him however an unlooked-for sudden fate bereaved of life but i hornet stricken am driven by the scourge divine from land to land 
thou hearest what has taken place and if thou art able to say what pangs there remain for me declare them and do not compassionating me warm me with false tales for i pronounce fabricated statements to be a most foul malady ah ah forbear alas never never did i expect that a tale so strange would come to my ears or that sufferings thus horrible to witness and horrible to endure, outrages, terrors with their two-edged goad, would chill my spirit. Alas! Alas! O oh, fate! Fate! I shudder as I behold the condition of Io. Prematurely, however, art thou sighing, and art full of terror. Hold until thou shalt also have heard the residue. Say on, inform me fully, to the sick, indeed, it is sweet to get a clear knowledge beforehand of the sequel of their sorrows. Your former desire, at any rate, ye gained from me easily. For first of all ye desired to be informed by her recital of the affliction that attaches to herself. Now give ear to the rest. What sort of sufferings it is the fate of this young damsel before you to undergo at the hand of Juno? Thou too, seed of Inachus, lay to heart my words, that thou mayest be fully informed of the termination of thy journey. In the first place, after turning thyself from this spot toward the rising of the sun, traverse unploughed fields, and thou wilt reach the wandering Scythians, who, raised from off the ground, inhabit wicker dwellings on well-wheeled cars, equipped with distant shooting bows, to whom thou must not draw near, but pass on out of their land, bringing thy feet to approach the rugged, roaring shores, and on thy left hand dwell the Calibes, workers of iron, of whom thou must needs beware for they are barbarous and not accessible to strangers. And thou wilt come to the river Hebristes, not falsely so called, which do not thou cross, for it is not easy to ford, until thou shalt have come to Caucasus itself, loftiest of mountains, where from its very brow the river spouts forth its might. And surmounting its peaks, that neighbour on the stars, thou must go into a southward track, where thou wilt come to the man-detesting host of Amazons, who hereafter shall make a settlement, Themyscira, on the banks of Thermodon, where lies the rugged Salmodessian sea-gorge, a host by mariners hated, a step dame to ships. And they will conduct thee on thy way, and that right willingly. Thou shalt come, too, to the Cimmerian Isthmus, hard by the very portals of a lake, with narrow passage, which thou undauntedly must leave, and cross the Maotic Frith. And there shall exist for evermore among mortals a famous legend concerning thy passage, and after thy name it shall be called the Bosphorus and after having quitted European ground, thou shalt come to the Asiatic continent. Does not then the sovereign of the gods seem to you to be violent alike toward all things? For he, a god, lusting to enjoy the charms of this mortal fair one, hath cast upon her these wanderings, and a bitter wooer, maiden, hast thou found for thy hand. For think that the words which thou hast now heard are not even for a prelude. Woe is me! Ah! Ah! Thou too in thy turn art crying out and mourning. What wilt thou do then when thou learnest the residue of thy ills? What? Hast thou aught of suffering left to tell to her? Aye, a tempestuous sea of baleful calamities. What gain then is it for me to live? But why did I not quickly fling myself from this rough precipice, that dashing on the plain I had rid myself of all my pangs? For better is it once to die, than all one's days to suffer ill. Verily, thou wouldst hardly bear the agonies of me to whom it is not doomed to die, for this will be an escape from sufferings. But now there is no limit set to my hardships, until Jove shall have been deposed from his tyranny. What? Is it possible that Jupiter should ever fall from his power? Glad wouldst thou be, I ween, to witness this event. And how not so, I, who through Jupiter am suffering ill? Well then, thou mayest assure thyself of these things that they are so. By whom is he to be despoiled of his sceptre of tyranny? Himself, by his own senseless counsels. In what manner? Specify it, if there be no harm. He will make such a match as he shall one day rue. Celestial or mortal? If it may be spoken, tell me. But why ask its nature? For it is not a matter that I can communicate to you. Is it by a consort that he is to be ejected from his throne? Yes, 
surely one that shall give birth to a son mightier than the father and has he no refuge from this misfortune not he indeed before at any rate i after being liberated from my shackles who then is he that shall liberate thee in despite of jupiter it is ordained that it shall be one of thine own descendants how sayest thou shall child of mine release thee from thy ills yes the third of thy lineage in addition to ten other generations this prophecy of thine is no longer easy for me to form a guess upon nor seek thou to know over well thine own pangs do not after proffering me a benefit withhold it from me i will freely grant thee one of two disclosures explain to me first of what sort they are and allow me my choice i allow it thee for choose whether i shall clearly tell to thee the residue of thy troubles or who it is that is to be my deliverer of these twain do thou vouchsafe to bestow the one boon on this damsel and the other on me and disdain thou not my request to her tell the rest of her wanderings and to me him that is to deliver thee for this i long to hear seeing that ye are eagerly bent upon it i will not oppose your wishes so as not to utter everything as much as ye desire to thee in the first place i owe will i describe thy mazy wanderings which do thou engrave on the recording tablets of thy mind when thou shalt have crossed the stream that is the boundary of the continents to the ruddy realms of morn where walks the sun having passed over the roaring swell of the sea until thou shalt reach the gorgonian plains of Sisthene, where dwell the Phocides, three swan-like aged damsels that possess one eye in common that have but a single tooth on whom ne'er doth the sun glance with his rays nor the nightly moon and hard by are three winged sisters of these the snake-tressed gorgons aboard of mortals whom none of human race can look upon and retain the breath of life such is this caution which i mention to thee now lend an ear to another hideous spectacle for be on thy guard against the keen-fanged hounds of jupiter that never bark the griffins and the cavalry host of one-eyed aramaspians who dwell on the banks of the gold-gushing fount the stream of pluto go not thou nigh to these and thou wilt reach a far distant land a dark tribe who dwell close upon the fountains of the sun where is the river ethiops along the banks of this wend thy way until thou shalt have reached the cataract where from the biblene mountains the nile pours forth his hallowed grateful stream this will guide thee to the triangular land of the nile where at length io it is ordained for thee and thy children after thee to found the distant colony and if aught of this is obscurely uttered and hard to be understood question me anew and learn it thoroughly and clearly as for leisure i have more than i desire if indeed thou hast aught to tell of her baleful wanderings that still remains or hath been omitted say on but if thou hast told the whole give to us in our turn the favour which we ask and you perchance remember she hath heard the full term of her journeying and that she may not know that she hath not been listening to me in vain i will relate what hardships she endured before she came hither giving her this as a sure proof of my statements the very great multitude indeed of words i shall omit and i will proceed to the termination itself of thine aberrations for after that thou had come to the molossian plains and about the lofty ridge of dodona where is the oracular seat of thesprotian jove and a portent passing belief the speaking oaks by which thou wast clearly and without any ambiguity saluted illustrious spouse of jove that art to be if aught of this hath any charms for thee thence madly rushing along the seaside track thou didst dart away to the vast bay of rhea from which thou art tempest driven in retrograde courses and in time to come know well that the gulf of the deep shall be called ionian a memorial of thy passage to all mortals these hast thou as tokens of my intelligence how that it perceives somewhat beyond what appears the rest i shall tell both to you and to her in common after reaching the very identical track of my former narrative there is on the land's utmost edge a city canopus hard by the nile's very mouth and alluvial dyke on this spot jupiter at length makes thee sane by merely soothing and touching thee with his unalarming hand and named after the progeniture of jupiter thou shalt give birth to swarthy epaphus who shall reap the harvest of all the land which the wide streaming nile waters but fifth in descent from him a generation of fifty virgins shall again come to argos not of their own accord fleeing from incestuous wedlock with their cousins and these with fluttering hearts like falcons left not far behind by doves 
shall come pursuing marriage such as should not be pursued. But heaven shall be jealous over their persons, and Pelasgia shall receive them after being crushed by a deed of night-fenced daring, wrought by woman's hand, for each bride shall bereave her respective husband of life, having died in their throats a sword of twin sharp edge. Would that in guise like this Venus might visit my foes! But tenderness shall soften one of the maidens, so that she shall not slay the partner of her couch, but shall be blunt in her resolve, and of the two alternatives she shall choose the former, to be called a coward rather than a murderess. She in Argus shall give birth to a race of kings. There needs a long discourse to detail these things distinctly, but from this seed be sure shall spring a dauntless warrior, renowned in archery, who shall set me free from these toils. Such predictions did my aged mother, the Titaness Themis, rehearse to me. But how and when? To tell this requires a long detail, and thou, in knowing it all, wouldst be in naught againer. Ilileo, Ilileo, once more the spasm and maddening frenzies inflame me, and the sting of the hornet wrought by no fire envenoms me, and with panic my heart throbs violently against my breast. My eyes, too, are rolling in a mazy whirl, and I am carried out of my course by the raging blast of madness, having no control of tongue, but my troubled words dash idly against the surges of loathsome calamity. Exit Io Wise was the man, I wise indeed, who first weighed well this maxim, and with his tongue published it abroad, that to match in one's own degree is best by far, and that one who lives by labour should woo the hand neither of any that have waxed wanton in opulence, nor of such as pride themselves on nobility of birth. Never, O oh destinies, never may ye behold me approaching as a partner the couch of Jupiter, nor may I be brought to the arms of any bridegroom from among the sons of heaven." For I am in dread when I behold the maiden Io, contented with no mortal lover, greatly marred by wearisome wanderings at the hand of Juno. For myself, indeed, inasmuch as wedlock on one's own level is free from apprehension, I feel no alarm. And, oh, never may the love of the mightier gods cast on me a glance that none can elude. This, at least, is a war without a conflict, accomplishing things impossible nor know I what might become of me, for I see not how I could evade the counsel of Jove. Yet truly shall Jove, albeit he is self-willed in his temper, be lowly, in such wedlock is he prepared to wed, as shall hurl him out of his sovereignty, and off his throne a forgotten thing, and the curse of his father Saturn shall then at length find entire consummation, which he imprecated when he was deposed from his ancient throne. From disasters such as these there is no one of the gods beside myself, that can clearly disclose to him a way of escape. I know this, and by what means. Wherefore let him rest on in his presumption, putting confidence in his thunders aloft, brandishing in his hand a fire-breathing bolt, for not one jot shall these suffice to save him from falling dishonoured in a downfall beyond endurance. Such an antagonist is he now with his own hands preparing against himself, a portent that shall baffle all resistance, who shall invent a flame more potent than the lightning, and a mighty din that shall surpass the thunder, and shall shiver the ocean trident, that earth-convulsing pest, the spear of Neptune. And when he hath stumbled upon this mischief, he shall be taught how great is the difference between sovereignty and slavery. Thou, forsooth, art boding against Jupiter the things thou wishest. Things that shall come to pass, and that I desire to boot. And are we to expect that any one will get the mastery of Jove? Ay, and pangs too, yet harder to bear than these of mine shall he sustain. And how is it that thou art not dismayed, blurting out words such as these? Why, at what should I be terrified, to whom it is not destined to die? Yet perchance he will provide for the affliction more grievous than even this. Let him do it, then. All is foreseen by me. They that do homage to Adrastea are wise. Do homage, make thy prayer, cringe to each ruler of the day. I care for Jove less than nothing. Let him do, let him lord it for this brief span, e'en as he list, for not long shall he rule over the gods. But no more, for I descry Jove's courier close at hand, the menial of the new monarch. Beyond all doubt, he has come to announce to us some news. Enter Mercury. Thee, the contriver, 
thee full of gall and bitterness who sinned against gods by bestowing their honours on creatures of a day the thief of fire i address the sir commands thee to divulge of what nuptials it is that thou art wanting by means of which he is to be put down from his power and these things moreover without any kind of mystery but each exactly as it is do thou tell out and entail not upon me prometheus a double journey and thou perceivest that by such conduct joe is not softened high sounding if earth and full of haughtiness is thy speech as beseems a lackey of the gods young in years ye are young in power and ye fancy forsooth that ye dwell in a citadel impregnable against sorrow have i not known two monarchs dethroned from it and the third that now is ruler i shall also see expelled most foully and most quickly seem i to thee in aught to be dismayed at and to crouch beneath the new gods widely i altogether do i come short of such feelings but do thou hie thee back the way by which thou camest for not one tittle shalt thou learn of the matter on which thou questionest me it truly it was by such self will even before now that thou didst bring thyself to such a calamity as mooring be well assured that i would not barter my wretched plight for thy drudgery for better do i deem it to be a lackey to this rock than to be born the confidential courier of father jove thus is it meet to repair insult in kind thou seems to revel in thy present state revel would that i might see my foes thus revelling and among these i reckon thee what dost thou impute to me also any blame for thy mischances in plain truth i detest all the gods as many of them as after having received benefits at my hands are iniquitously visiting me with evils i hear thee raving with no slight disorder disordered i would be if disorder it be to loathe one's foes thou wouldst be beyond endurance were thou in prosperity woe's me this word of thine joe knows not ay but time as he grows old teaches all things and yet verily thou knowest not yet how to be discreet no i faith or i should not have held parley with thee menial as thou art thou seems disposed to tell not of the things which the sire desires in sooth being under obligation as i am to him i am bound to return his favour thou flutest me forsooth as if i were a boy why art thou not a boy and yet sillier than one if thou lookest to obtain any information from me there is no outrage nor artifice by which jupiter shall bring me to utter this before my torturing shackles shall have been loosened wherefore let his glowing lightning be hurled and with the white feathered shower of snow and the thunderings beneath the earth let him confound and embroil the universe for naught of these things shall bend me so much as even to say by whom it is doomed that he shall be put down from his sovereignty consider now whether this determination seems availing long since has this been considered and resolved resolve o vain one resolve at length in consideration of thy present sufferings to come to thy right senses thou troublest me with thine admonitions as vainly as thou mightest a billow never let it enter your thoughts that i affrighted by the purpose of jupiter shall become womanish and shall importune the object whom i greatly loathe with effeminate upliftings of my hands to release me from these shackles i want much of that with all that i have said i seem to be speaking to no purpose for not one whit art thou melted or softened in thy heart by entreaties but art champing the bit like a cold fresh yoked and struggling against thy reins but on the strength of an impotent scheme art thou thus violent for obstinacy in one not soundly wise itself by itself availed less than nothing and mark if thou art not persuaded by my words what a tempest and threefold surge of wills from which there is no escape will come upon thee for in the first place the sire will shiver the craggy cleft with thunder and blaze of his bolt and will overwhelm thy body and a clasping arm of rock shall bear thee up and after thou shalt have passed through its close a long space of time thou shalt come back into the light and a winged hound of jupiter a blood thirsting eagle shall ravenously mangle thy huge lacerated frame stealing upon thee an unbidden guest and tearing all the live long day and shall banquet his fill on the black viands of thy liver to such labours look thou for no termination until some god shall appear as a substitute in thy pangs and shall be willing to go both to the gloomy heights and to the murky depths around tartarus wherefore advise thee 
since this is no fictitious want but uttered in great earnestness for the divine mouth knows not how to utter falsehood but will bring thy every word to pass but do thou look around and reflect and never for a moment deem pertinacity better than discretion to us indeed mercury seems to propose no unseasonable counsel for he bids thee to abandon thy recklessness and seek out wise consideration be persuaded for to a wise man tis disgraceful to err to me already well aware of it hath this fellow urged his message but for a foe to suffer horribly at the hands of foes is no indignity wherefore let the doubly pointed wreath of his fire be hurled at me and ether be torn piecemeal by thunder and spasm of savage blasts and let the wind rock earth from her base roots and all and with stormy surge mingle in rough tide the billow of the deep and the paths of the stars and fling my body into black tartarus with a whirl in the stern eddies of necessity yet by no possible means shall he visit me with death resolutions and expressions in truth such as these of thine one may hear from maniacs for in what point doth his fate shall fall short of insanity what doth it abate from ravings but do ye then at any rate that sympathize with him in his sufferings withdraw and speedily some weather from the spot lest the harsh bellowing of the thunder smite you with idiotcy utter and advise me to something else in which too thou mayest prevail upon me for in this be sure thou hast intruded a proposal not to be borne how is it that thou urgest me to practice baseness along with him here i am willing to endure what is destined for i have learned to abhor traitors and there is no evil which i hold in greater abomination well then bear in mind the things of which i forewarn you and do not when ye have been caught in the snares of hate throw the blame on fortune nor ever at any time say that joe cast you into unforeseen calamity no indeed but ye your own selves for well aware and not on a sudden nor in ignorance will ye be entangled by your senselessness in an impervious net of hate exit mercury and verily indeed and no longer in word doth the earth heave and the roaring echo of thunder rolls bellowing by us and deep blazing wreaths of lightning are glaring and hurricanes whirl the dust and blasts of all the winds are leaping forth showing one against the other a strife of conflict gusts and the firmament is embroiled with the deep such is this onslaught that is clearly coming upon me from jove a cause for terror o dread majesty of my mother earth o ether that diffusest thy common light thou beholdest the wrongs i suffer end of part two end of prometheus bound by aeschylus translated by theodore alois buckley